Thank y'all. Y'all too kind. Thank you. <laughs> How y'all doing? All right. In 2012, I began a postdoctorate research position to examine the natural history, ecology, and behavior of the giant pouched rat in Tanzania. These large rodents have been successfully trained to detect explosives as well as lung disease. An amazing innovation in the fight to save millions of lives that are impacted by landmines as well as tuberculosis around the world. Here's the catch. The breeding program, for tra the breeding program that's designed to funnel rats into that program is hit or miss. And there's no formal way to select the subjects that would be ideal for the training of which only 35% of the rats successfully complete in this nearly one year long training process. The applied science was put ahead of the basic research. And my mission when I joined the program was to help decipher the basic biology and social organization of the rodent. When I came on board, the narrative was that we, science, trademark, knew little to nothing about this species because the published record was so thin. I knew going in I had a lot of work to do. And what I came to realize, not the least of which, was confronting my own childhood-informed, very romanticized notions of Africa. One perception was shaped by wildlife programs. You know, Africa was this wide world where adventures were and discoveries were made. The other was dominated by, you know, influence of black liberation philosophies, that it was this, you know, monolith, pan-African homeland, complete with the dusty savanna in the backdrop in the picture. I thought because of my family history and heritage, as in those influences of black liberation philosophies, I thought when I got to Tanzania, I was, I was ready. I was the most woke person possible to do this research. I was so wrong. First, I didn't even have the name of this species correct. <laughs> We're calling it Chrysidomys gambianus, which lives in West Africa. And now by the time when I joined the program, a paper had only recently come out that was led by a team of Nigerian scientists that had reorganized the taxonomy and had renamed the pouch rats that live in Tanzania, Chrysidomys and Sorgii. Right. I was also way off base about who I was while I was there. Now, I had anticipated that my brown skin would help me to blend in but it didn't really help me blend in as much as I had imagined. I made some really big missteps early on, and it signaled that I needed to take a deep pause and think about how I moved and behaved and interacted with people there. Mzungu, that's the singular. The plural is wazungu. In Swahili, it means foreigner. It is often used in reference to white people who are there visiting. But I had to confront and really come to terms with how Western I was. I too was in Zungu. I'm very grateful for that deep pause I had in my very first expedition here, so early on in my research time. And that's because it really forced me to take a look at myself and my training as a scientist. And what it meant for me, a black person of African and various other unknown descents, a woman, an American, a U.S. Southerner who has a family history of enslavement and trauma from Jim Crow laws. In the States, I do science mostly in the context of scrutiny and challenge, where I'm usually the only one or very few persons of color. I've become so accustomed to being challenged and my expertise dismissed, I didn't know how to behave in a place where I was, it was completely novel to me. I was doing science around other black people, African scientists and students. I didn't understand that. But I also soon, to, soon came to realize it was the American part of my identity, so that African and American. But the American part of my identity put me in a relative position 
that was very unfamiliar to me. When you come to do science from a Western institution, I learned that I had some privileges bestowed upon me that I did not earn, and I was not ready for that. I came to Tanzania to do science, and that means learning. Watching how some other Western scientists interacted with our Tanzanian colleagues made me very uncomfortable. And I committed to not copying their mistakes or their poor behavior. I believe your values are reflected in your work. So I asked myself, what kind of scientist am I? And what kind of science do I produce? In animal research, doing science without regard to how you treat animals is inhumane. Doing science without regard to how you uh, spend your cult capital resources like time or money is wasteful. But what about how you treat people? Your local hosts, your guides, your research assistants, even the townspeople or your drivers or the field station staff. When we disregard how we treat people in science, we may call it disrespect, but unlike those first two violations, it's not classified as unethical. There are no codified professional consequences for being rude or arrogant. <laughs> And this oversight seems especially problematic when Western scientists go to developing nations or do their research among indigenous communities. It was time with colleagues at the Sokowini University of Agriculture in Morogoro, Tanzania, that I began evaluating my science practices. I declared, I would only do science that can bring, where I could bring my whole self and of which I could be proud, which meant recentering my science practices on the values of justice and respect. Yeah, my original inspiration when I got there may have been to make a name for myself studying the species. Funded natural history research opportunities of this kind don't really come around much anymore. But no matter how much I had dreamed before I went there the first time of being the first or the most preeminent person whose name would be high in the publication record when it came to this new and novel species, I realized that would be a lie. A stranger can't discover something in someone else's home. <laughs> And I, recognize, and I recognize that if you look up pouch rats, especially on the science side, my name comes up. But everything I know is due to the man in this photo, Shabani Lutea. He is the world's expert on giant pouch rats. In fact, that program that trains rats successfully would not exist without him. Every single rat that has been caught and trained in that program to sniff out TB or landmines, this man personally caught. And so it's spending time at SUA, that's the abbreviation for it, my host institution, I began to listen and I shifted my perspective. I realized I had more than an opportunity. It was a privilege. I have the privilege of working with Tanzanian scientists. And with that privilege comes a great responsibility of preparing other Western scientists, junior and senior scholars alike, on how to do science in that indigenous space. <laughs> I have the honor of working with some amazing people who are, first of all, very generous and patient with me. <laughs> and they entrust me with their precious teachings, their stories, their folklore, their science and who welcome me not only as a colleague, but as a friend, and very often treat me as family. I'm a natural historian. I study natural history of animals. 
Listening is my most essential scientific skill. I listen with my ears, my eyes, my heart, my spirit. Listening to elders, the residents, the keepers, the indigenous people of any place is the demonstration of the very first scientific step in the scientific method that we learn in school, observation. Listening is good science, and that's doing science right.